would have changed if I had simply encountered someone who had a reason for the hope that lies within them, which, by the way, is a biblical command from 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to share a reason for the hope that lies within you. And the first time I met a Christian who was ready with that was in college. So I've already decimated the faith of a lot of people going up to college. <laughs> and then I get to college very confident in myself. And I meet a friend. Now this friend and I were out on a public speaking and uh, debate tournament. And uh, we were sharing a room together. And I saw him one night reading the Bible. And I thought, okay, this will be fun. Let's take down another Christian. It'll be amusing. And so I look at my friend, his name was David. I said, David, do you realize that book you're reading is not trustworthy? It's been corrupted over time. And he's reading his Bible and he closes it and he says, go on. Which should have been a sign for me that this wasn't gonna go my way, but I just <laughs> kept going. And I said, David, Jesus spoke Aramaic, did he not? And then the earliest church was in Palestine, it was in Jerusalem, it was, it was in Israel, so they must have spoken Hebrew, but by the time the New Testament's written, it's written in Greek. So you have a translation of a translation of Jesus' words before it's ever written down. And then the New Testament that lasted the longest period of time in the church was not actually in Greek, it was in Latin. So you have another translation, then it's in Latin for a thousand years before it comes into German, and from German it goes into English, and that's where we get the KJV. It's a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation, which is why you have the KJV, the NIV, the ESV, the NASV, the who knows what V. You got so many versions of the Bible, how can I know which one's actually the word of God? Now that had worked on many Christians and I was ready for him to crumple under the weight of my argumentation. But David looked at me and he said, Nabil, let me ask you a question. Just a few minutes ago, I heard you speaking to your mom on the phone. Was that in English? I said, no. And he said, but when you told me what she said, you told me in English. Was that a corrupted translation? No. He said, Nabil, when you are multilingual, you can take a message that's given in one language and accurately translate that message into another language, and you've preserved the message. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They're able to listen to Jesus, whatever language Jesus spoke, and write it in Greek. And of that Greek New Testament manuscript, we have in our possession over 6,000 copies today. And he said, Nabil, if we didn't have any one of those copies, we have in our possession over 10,000 Latin, Coptic, and Syriac translations of the early Greek New Testament manuscripts. And he said, if we didn't have any of those translations, we have over 30,000 quotations of the New Testament from the early church fathers with which we can reconstruct virtually the entire New Testament many times over again. Nabil, we know with certainty the message of the original New Testament. And I looked at him and I said, David, you're making this up. <laughs> I said, I've talked to dozens of Christians. No one have told me this before. He said, you think I'm making this up? I said, yeah, I think you're making this up. He said, well, then you better bring it. I'm like, it's been 